Okay, so I'm going to call the May 21st meeting of the Jericho Planning Commission to order. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us here in the town hall in the middle of one of the first summer thunderstorms. I guess that's how you know it's really summer, almost summer in Vermont. Uh, for our agenda this evening, we have the majority of our time will be a continuation of our work with David White. Uh, the town's consultant from Sterling Mountain Planning and Community Design, Community Planning and Design, right, right, um, who is working with us on a grant to modernize our bylaws with a focus on Jericho's three village centers. So we'll spend um, the majority of our time tonight doing that. We have two times for public comment once at the beginning of the meeting where we uh, invite the public to comment on anything that's on your mind. And then after the presentation, we have another bit of time for public comment and we ask that you um, contain those comments to specifically to the topic of the presentation. Uh, we are going to use a timer and um, allow for individuals to speak for about three minutes if they choose to share comments with the planning commission. Then we're gonna debrief on the most recent meetings that were held by the select board about the current wastewater feasibility study, which the town has um, been in progress on for quite some time. And uh, several people from the planning commission have attended those meetings recently. Then we will, um, share some information about other events, look at any other business and plan our next two meetings, June 4th and June 18th. Does anybody need to make any changes or adjustments to the agenda? All right, so hearing none, then we'll move on to public comment. And I would invite people in the room, if you have a public comment to come forward to use the microphone after I recognize you, it's on the table. And if you're on the Zoom, if you would please use the raise hand feature so we can call in. Does anybody here have a comment? Uh, Bill. Hello. Hello. I'm Bill Butler. And someone asked last uh, at the last meeting or made a comment that uh, were there any jobs going to be created by the development in Riverside? And I believe, as I've been looking at this a long time, that there will be approximately 85 jobs created with the intelligent uh, development of Riverside. So that's an answer to a public question from the Zoom at the last meeting. And that's Thank, Thank you. you. Chuck. Chuck Lacey, Jericho Center, 25 miles an hour. Um, I think, well, what, certainly when I talk with people, and I think it's kind of evident among many of the people involved in sort of housing and planning, is that the priority for wastewater is for 200 units in CB4. And I don't think our consultant knows that, or he's certainly not pursuing that as the priority. Um, when I look at, you know, it seems like Tillotson Drive and Clover Lane are equally prioritized with, you know, with CB4. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's also clear that we're not gonna do all the projects and we know what the priority is. And my suggestion is that the planning commission figure out who's providing direction to the engineer, it's apparently a mystery, and encourage them to, prioritize, uh, you know, CB4 or CB4 and Riverside uh, for the study, you know, get that done first. Uh, if for some reason we're handcuffed, as often happens with small dollar grants, do a carve out and just say, you know, we'll come up with the extra $40,000 or whatever it is. But, you know, we have described housing as a crisis you have said if the wastewater is not done, then the work you're currently doing is a waste of time. We've been in diddle mode for a long time. It just seems like we ought to be prioritizing the thing that we all agree is uh, is the highest priority. 
and somebody <laughs> needs to communicate whoever isn't responsible for directing the and, and establishing the objectives and providing direction to the engineer should i believe make it clear that that's the priority and you rejected the idea of a completion date it was a recommendation from the uh, affordable housing committee and that's sort of how things get done when i look at burlington high school what they've gotten done that district they had they set a deadline first and work backwards and they make decisions based on a deadline we've described we've described this project as being critical to addressing a crisis and i think we need to be, you know i think we need to be really clear we want wastewater here in two years and have the engineer start with that date and work backwards. And let's not be controlled by some archaic formula. You know, we're a rich town, we're 5,000 people, and we're just captive to these little grants. That's not how you get stuff done. Thank you. Anyone else in the room first? Yes, I'll go. Anybody online? Okay, so then we will move on to approving the minutes of May 7th. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Chris, thank you. Second. Second. Wendy, thank you. Uh, any edits or corrections to the minutes? All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone opposed? Extensions? Okay, so the minutes of May 7th are approved. Uh, next up is the bylaw modernization grant discussion. I'd like to invite David to come forward and join us. Thank you again for coming this evening. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen. Do I have to allow that or are you? I, I did. Are you the one? Okay. And my understanding is that there are handouts here of David's presentation. If you would like to have a paper copy at the table where you signed in. <laughs> Eric. You want to come around the side so you can see better? I can't I really want to avoid being there. <laughs> oh, really? It <sighs> just, seems, just seems like it's become like a... Well, you can... Everyone I can, can slide can, down I can one. Slide, slide down one. Because it seemed like we were on the edge there. I also printed some zoning. Eric, did you get in the back in school? I, I'm not going to disclose that. <laughs> I was not. Would any of you like the zoning map to go along with? Chris is afraid to move forward. We're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. musical chairs, right? Yep. Everybody up on Hold on. Now, now you get the wet seat. I'm waiting. <laughs> like musical chairs. I guess it wouldn't be easier if I just came out there. Well, that would be best for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. You and the audience should all stand up and turn around three times. Yes. So we don't feel so bad. <laughs> I was getting dizzy. Okay, we're ready. All right. Are you ready? You are. Everybody comfortable? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Dry seats? Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. So um, tonight is a continuation of the conversation about Riverside. Um, and we're going to focus on the area that is in the character district three, as well as the area at, which is part of the character based zoning is then as well as the area outside of that, that's currently in the village center district under the conventional zoning. <laughs> I'm going to touch on a couple of really important findings um, through this presentation before we kind of turn ourselves towards, okay, so what are we going to do about it? Um, but I think it's really important to take the time to walk through and be sure that you are all um, have a, a better understanding of, of what I've seen as some of the key issues 
um, that are associated with the existing zoning. So that when we talked about making changes, you've got a clear understanding as kind of, of where that's coming from. And, and part of this, and particularly tonight, it's about let's get the right parts in the right places um, from, to create a good foundation to then talk about a level of detail. I know that you want to get into the details, dimensional standards and uses and things like that, but I'm, at least for me and the conversations I've had primarily with Linda, but some with Susan, we get tripped up when we're talking about, well, what district are we talking about? And um, and we need to kind of sort some of that out first. Uh, and that's what um, tonight's really focused on. So um, you're making a lot more progress than I think uh, perhaps you uh, can appreciate, um, but it's really important to focus on the, the things of, or the areas where um, I see that the current regulations being broken. So first part of this conversation or is understanding the ge geography. So last meeting we talked about character district four. Um, tonight we'll talk about character district, district three. So the difference here as the ordinance is written is that character district four is a place where you are intending to have the greatest variety of uses, um, the most intensity, diversity of building types and activities, that's really the core mixed use area. Character District 3, on the other hand, uh, is much more residential uh, in its intent. So this uh, is part of the uh, character-based zoning. Um, it's mostly residential uh, in terms of its use. You see some of the statistics on the screen about, you know, the lot sizes um, go as, as small as almost a tenth of an acre, but many of them are under uh, two tenths of an acre, um, mostly residential. But what's key here is that there are a number of buildings that have frontages, meaning they face Route 15. Um, and that perhaps creates an opportunity that I want to talk about uh, a little bit more um, later on. The other area is what is now outside of the character-based zoning, which is shaded out in kind of the pink-white color on the screen. Um, and this is the village center zoning district as part of the conventional zoning. So this zoning district is applied to this part of Riverside and it's also applied to Jericho Corners and Jericho Center. Um, we're, we're gonna talk about those two areas separately, but um, just as a general understanding. Um, so this um, area is all still within about a half mile walk uh, of Route 15 and kind of the core of, of the character district in, in uh, excuse me, in Riverside. Um, the, the most of the residentially scaled lots are bigger, uh, typically about the size of the minimum lot size, which is a quarter acre um, lot, um, because they were largely laid out um, post zoning. And by, in contrast, uh, many of those lots in CD3 uh, predated zone, which is why they're much smaller. <laughs> um, they have larger frontages. They have larger setbacks. Um, they are almost exclusively residential in use, with the exception of the two properties on the other on the uh, the south and east side of River Road, which is Browns River Middle School, Middle School. Uh, Deborah Rawson Library and uh, Mills Riverside Park. Um, but everything else is is predominantly residential. And there's quite a bit of floodplain and wetland that forms a kind of northern boundary to this entire area, um, which is going to constrain the development potential. So I want to go back to this slide for a moment. We talked about this at the last meeting. Um, because I've tried to organize these conversations uh, for Riverside to flow from the center outward. Um, so that natural transition from more compact, more mixed use uh, part of Riverside to where it becomes more residential and, and less compact. 
that's really the organizing principle around the, the rural transect. And any zoning ordinance is based on some sort of an organizing principle. And, and they're very commonly, you have your center where most development happens, most intense development happens. And as you progress outward from that, things become less mixed, things become less, uh, less dense. And <clears throat> in this image, I've replaced the names of the different portions of the transect with your zoning districts. Um, and you'll see, I think, right, hopefully right away that for the area that we're talking about on the far right end, the town center and the village residential, um, there's, there's a bit of a mi mismatch in how the village residential zoning uh, is applied relative to what I grouped together as town center, um, CD4, and the village center zoning district. Um, so because of that disconnect, um, CD3 being predominantly residential, uh, and this is Susan's term, not mine, but it creates a moat around CD3, where and you go CD4. from, what's that? Around, around CD4. CD4. So you have you have a CD4, which is compact mixed use district. Then you go to a CD3, which is compact, but dominantly residential. <clears throat> and then you go back out to the village center, which is intended to be compact mixed use again. So these things should lo should logically flow from one to the other, and, and they don't um, as they're currently defined. So this is the, what's really important in a zoning ordinance when you're establishing a zoning district is you, you create a very clear intention describing what is, what is this district supposed to be doing? What is our expectation of development in this in this district? So this is what's currently the intent intent statement purpose statement uh, for CD three, um, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I, there are a number of things in here that I think again are are disconnects from what my understanding of what the expectation for development in Riverside um, should be. I mean, do you really think of this area as being rural? And is that what you really want given its context and its potential? Um, is it really intended to be low density? Um, is this district, does, does this district really allow for a mix of, uh, of different kinds of residential uses and housing types? Um, we've talked about that before. I'll highlight that more going forward that it really only allows for one housing type. That's a single unit building. Um, and what, is it actually walkable and pedestrian friendly if it may occur without curbs and sidewalks? Curbs, less of an issue, but sidewalks are pretty critical to making for a pedestrian friendly walkable environment. So again, there's a disconnect just in the ordinance about what's the purpose of this district relative to what um, you're trying for uh, in, the, in the plan. So this then is the purpose statement for the village center district and the conventional um, zoning. Uh, it's really long. So this is just uh, paraphrased here. Um, but the, the key point is that this is envisioned as, uh, again, a, a mixed use, more compact um, area talking about development um, on parcels fronting along Route 15. Well, as applied to Riverside, because the character-based zoning cut a hole out of the middle of the village center district, not much of this actually applies anymore to the what is designated as village center in Riverside. Um, so the bottom line here is that these two districts need to be redefined in order to reflect what's the actual intended purpose based on where um, they're intended to sit on the ground. So we've talked about the, some of these dimensional standards, and I'm not going to spend any time with this because we'll come back to it, but simply highlighting um, what, the, um, what those dimensional standards are in the village center district, in, the, um, in, the, um, in CD3, and you know, clearly the village center district the standards are, are a sharp uh, disconnect from what the objective is um, for this uh, part of town. Um, similarly, 
the intensity limits again um, cd3 is is a pretty good fit but um, the village center district isn't um, and then finally when it comes to to uses um, actually <clears throat> The village center district is is really pretty good with the exception of the residential uses um, and CD3 is really off track um, when it comes to residential uses. The, the key issue with uh, the village center district is that while three and four and five or more households are permitted, it's really difficult to do that um, with a minimum lot size and basically a minimum lot per lot size per unit of a quarter of an acre. Um, you need to have a pretty big lot to be able to do that five unit building, if at all. So these are some things that we're going to look at in a lot more detail going forward. Um, sorry, the, the last part of this is the development process. We've talked about waivers and the need to have op opportunities for greater flexibility built into the ordinance. But in particular, um, the PUD process is really the only tool uh, in the ordinance today that allows you to do truly compact development. But but it, you have to go through that discretionary process in the village center district in order to, to have the smaller lots, to have the smaller setbacks, um, to uh, adjust the overall density requirements. Um, and that just that discretionary process and the time and money it takes to go through it is a disincentive. And that flexibility doesn't apply at all um, if it's just a single lot. If you're looking to do um, to subdivide a larger lot into two and do something more compact, you can't you can't access the PUD process uh, to be able to do that. So um, that becomes an issue. <laughs> so just to summarize what's been kind of a long conversation of a, uh, a variety of different um, issues that I've identified with the, the existing zoning. Um, that the character-based zoning is a good concept, but but poorly applied. Um, we've talked about the development standards. On-site parking and character-based zoning um, is way too high and is higher than it is anywhere else. And that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, the architectural standards are way too much. Um, and, and again, we've talked about all of these in, more, in, uh, in previous meetings. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them because I kind of want to get to the, the key part of the conversation for kind of decision making. So in the last presentation, we talked about some recommendation just around some broader big moves uh, that I would re recommend with the zoning ordinance. And that was completely rename the character-based zoning, undertake a lot of the things we talked about that was shown in the previous slide about development standards and parking standards and architectural standards relative to the character-based zoning. Um, those are all things that I think are important to be done, focused on that part of that part of the zoning. So tonight I want to introduce one more major change um, to both the character-based zoning, but also to the village center district um, that lies outside of this. And, and I think this, the purpose here is to define a much clearer relationship between kind of the, the heart, the mixed use compact center of Riverside and the, um, the, the less intense development uh, around that. So <clears throat> going back to the earlier slide, uh, this is what the current zoning districts are in Riverside. The blue is character district four, the green is character district three, and the red is the village center district. And on, also on this map, you can see along the northern edge here, um, the flood zone. Um, I think it's just important to, to keep that in mind that it, it, it really defines what the true northern edge um, of the development is likely to be in this area. Um, there is a, a up in the far corner um, up here is a dashed line. That is a half mile uh, from Route 15. So it defines what kind of a pedestrian area around Rivers, Riverside would be. So it's clearly all within a walking distance. And then 
the last one, there's a dashed line here that runs um, through here. And this is the boundary of the state designated village center district. So you will recall that the state designation programs uh, provide a number of benefits to communities with designated centers, whether it's a downtown center or a village center um, around um, planning grants uh, like, like the one we're working on here tonight, um, as well as infrastructure. Uh, and uh, a big one that just has come out of the legislature this year is exemption from Act 250 for larger residential projects. So um, that is the benefits afforded to the community with these kinds of designations are only going to get better and more meaningful <clears> at the time. So it's important that we keep that in mind. Not that your zoning has to reflect this area exactly, because I suspect in the not too distant future, you may be going to the state and seeking, seeking to have that boundary adjusted, making that area bigger as opposed to smaller. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good starting point. Can you, can you just sure. clarify? So the red is the town's designation of the village, village center. center and the dotted line is the state's correct okay correct just for the purposes of the um of the village center program <clears throat> so i'm suggesting that the zoning districts in riverside be changed to look more like this um what are you <clears throat> looking at So Chris asked this question at, uh, at the last meeting. Why doesn't CD4 include properties that are on, River, on Route 15? That's a really good question. I don't think it makes any sense at all for CD4 not to include Route 15 um, in the properties that are, that are abut on um, any of the major roads that surround the triangle here that uh, is formed by Park. Um, River Road and Route 15. So what I'm showing here is a proposed um, change to the zoning districts where CD4 is expanded um, to mm -hmm. include much of the extent of the village center designation, um, not all of it, because there are a couple of things that maybe don't make sense uh, to be zoned for uh, compact mixed use, and that's primarily the the dog leg of the village center designation that goes and cover covers Jerry Hill Apartments. You may feel differently about that, but that's certainly something we can talk about. Um, and to include any property that has frontage on Route 15, River Road, and Park Street. So expanding CD4 to encompass all of those areas. Um, essentially, then that gets rid of CD3. Um, This slide here shows in yellow uh, the properties that are currently zoned CD3, uh, but would not be included in, a, in an expansion of CD4. Um, and what I'm suggesting here is that those all become part of the village center district. So the character-based zoning then has only one district associated with it instead of two. Um, and it focuses uh, on everything that you see in blue or purple on the screen. Everything else outside of that is, for all intents and purposes, village center. Um, but going back to conversation at the last meeting, I would simply call these things something different. You have real, you have a Riverside Village Center District, and you have a Riverside Village Neighborhood District. So one is clearly the center compact mixed use development. The other one is much more residential uh, on the outskirts of that. Well, there's a, I think there's a, that right where the cursor is yep. on the map before that, it shows it as uh, CD, your proposed CBZ. Correct. So there, I'm, I was just about to come to that. So there's there's a couple of caveats to uh, to what I described before 
Um, so these yellow are areas that are currently zoned CD3, um, but wouldn't be in the future. One exception, exception to that is this triangle area. That's not really a triangle, but some trapezoid. trapezoid. There we go. I like that. This area here should become CD4 because it has frontage on Route 15. Okay. But you don't necessarily need to include the whole parcel. Um, right. And and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest that you include the whole parcel. The rest of this could become village center. So you split the parcel about where that dashed line is, which conforms with the village center designation boundary. Um, the green can can't have any questions from the audience right now. But is the green what is currently CD3, CD3 but would become CD4? Correct. And doesn't really have any question about it. Correct. And the yellow you're highlighting as CD3, not or not not a question, but they CD3 can either go left to village center or right to cd4 an off ramp and you're set and that's so yellow is cd3 going to village center green is cd3 going to cd4 correct correct except the trapezoid except for that yes trapezoid. Except for that and did you explain the criteria for so the criteria being for cd3 or i'm sorry cd4 are any property that is frontage on Route 15, River Road, and Park Street, all of that should be in CD4. Now, we talked about one um, difference here that this parcel gets split so that part of it is in CD4 and the rest of it goes into the Village Center District. The other two things are the middle school library and Mills Riverside Park properties. Now, I think there's a couple of options as to how you might treat those. Those could become part of the character-based zone zones. Um, in addition to CD3 and 4, you also have a civic zone. Um, these are civic uses. So they fit very nicely um, as part of the character-based zoning uh, for those civic uses. Um, other, or you can just leave them in village center. That I wouldn't anticipate. Uh, that any of those properties are going to see any sort of redevelopment uh, into something other than what they are. The one, the one property here that is uh, not a civic use is this um, parcel that's kind of right in between the library and um, and the middle school that I think is a yoga studio, dance studio of some form. So that's the only private property uh, in this complex, which based on what I saw as being the priorities, that probably ought to be CD4. Quick question for you on yeah. the space here between, um, it's Palmer Lane and the end. Looks like you're bisecting a number of lots there as well. Is that intentional? So up here? Yeah. Yeah, there are a number of lots where I drew the boundary to conform with the village center designation, um, okay. not because that's a great boundary, but because <laughs> you go you go much farther uh, west of that boundary, and you're immediately in a floodplain and wetland. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see a lot of value in showing you know this much larger parcel is being zoned for mixed use, but yeah, but you're going to really only use half of it. Okay, just want a clarification. Yep. All right. So in my mind, that's a pretty big move um, that I want to be sure that you have a chance to kind of think about, talk about. Um, but with that in place, then it, as I said, it forms a foundation for us to have uh, a much more logical conversation about, OK, then what actually happens in each one of these places? What are those dimensional standards? What uses are appropriate? here, and particularly when we think about the area outside of the center, outside of the core, um, what non-residential uses are appropriate there. Um, right now, it's 
they're pretty much all conditional uses. The, the only permitted uses in the village center district are where they occur along Route 15 or they're really small. So I, you don't want to take away opportunity that currently exists for properties there to do something. Um, but I think we simply need to be honest with ourselves about what does the zoning actually allow to have happen and what makes sense from a uh, non-residential non use um, perspective. So in concept, these are just descriptions of these two districts, the Riverside Village Neighborhood District, which is in red, the Riverside Village Center District, which is in blue, um, one emphasizing compact mixed use uh, development. The other one is is um, a variety of residential uh, housing types within walking distance uh, and smaller non-residential uses that function well within a predominantly residential area. You've got performance standards in your regulations that kind of help you deal with nuisances traveling across property boundaries, which um, I think can can find application as needed um, if you're if that becomes a concern. So where are we at with all of this, all of these different moving parts? So to summarize where I think we are um, in terms of the kind of bigger picture recommendations that I've made and I'm ready to kind of then jump into the details around, much more around. Um, for the Riverside Code, um, giving it, or, or uh, the character-based zoning, give it a new name that actually makes sense to people. This applies to Riverside. Um, it's not about character. It's about kind of physical form and layout of the development. Um, expand the CD4 to encompass the extent of the state designated village center and any properties with frontage on Route 15 River Road and Park Street and essentially eliminate CD3 um, from the code. Um, expanding the building types uh, to be possible throughout the, the new uh, Riverside Village Center. So all, all residential building types and mixed use building types um, are allowed in that district and make sure that all of the various yard types and yard configurations uh, are possible, that you can build on a side yard, as an example. Um, <clears throat> make as many uses as possible permitted. Um, um, and where they're not permitted, be really clear about what the criteria are for, uh, for review. Um, Add applicable site plan standards from section 11 into the village code, making them objective so that they're able to be administered by right rather than going through a discretionary review <laughs> process. There are many elements of them that are um, that are inherent to the form code as it is, but can be more explicit. Um, detail opportunities to increase flexibility from the standards by either the administrative office or the DRB. So really clear that you know, this standard or this group of standards can be adjusted by up to some amount um, based on certain criteria. Uh, it can go to a, that can be adjusted by a larger amount if you go to a DRB, go to the DRB, which has more discretion. Um, really paring down the prescriptive, overly prescriptive architectural standards, reducing on-site parking, clearing, cleaning up um, that section of ordinance overall. As for the conventional zoning as it applies to Riverside, um, the Riverside portion of the Village Center District um, get combined uh, into a single district outside of the character-based zoning. So this is part of your conventional zoning. Um, it's predominantly mi mixed residential district, but again, uh, a variety of non-residential uses can, should be permitted here. Um, where they work well and play well with residential uses and apply, largely applying compact development standards that you're, you've seen in the character-based zoning um, from setback, lot coverage, lot size, um, or what's allowed under the PUD um, to this new residential district. Um, <clears throat> So Linda actually created this slide 
Um, but I think it's a, and I think it's a really good kind of bringing us back to where we started that um, we're, we're making a series of changes that specifically tie back to um, the scope of changes that are recommended in the zoning for better, um, better places, Vermont neighborhoods that the state produced a couple of years ago. And we've talked about most of the specific recommendations here. And then coming attractions for future meetings, then we'll get into um, the village center district as it's applied to Jericho Corners and Jericho Center. What, sh what should it be? What should it look like? Um, is it the same for those two? Is it is it a little bit different? How do we uh, how do we apply that? But not you don't necessarily when you change the requirements or standards around one district, it doesn't have to automatically apply to every other part of town that is zoned in that same district. You can create a slightly different district um, based on the unique needs of that location, or you can carve out different standards for different. Um, sub geographies of that district. Um, we'll get into the use table in much more detail. Again, I think it makes a lot more sense when once we're talking about what the districts actually are and where they actually lay uh, to talk about what's appropriate, um, as well as the the site plan review standards um, and the uh, changes to the architectural standards. So that's kind of the gist of my presentation for tonight. And uh, my hope is that we can kind of go back and talk about these zoning district changes that um, I was suggesting. Get your take on that. Um, so I have a quick question. So do you imagine the Riverside Village Neighborhood District, its text and its standards live in the conventional section right. kind of as it does now? Yep. And chapter 13 then becomes only Riverside Village Center and potentially Civic. Yes. So it would have two instead of three, yep. not one. Mm -hmm. Yep, two. exactly. Okay. So um, just to clarify, the relative to the Act 250 revisions, um, the CBC, because it's within the state designated village center, is already cleared for the Act 250 revisions, right? It would Cor get the benefit of correct. That. And, and anything uh, as it currently stands today, whether it's um, well, it's all it's all character based zoning that's in that village center district, um, with the exception of Jerry Hill apartments. But there was a threshold, I think. Well, I don't know what was in the final version of the bill, but they had discussed a threshold of 50 units. I think that's up to in, 50 units. On 10 acres or fewer? Yeah. I, There's, I, but I, I'm I not sure. Okay. I have not seen the final okay. version of the bill, but it's something. But that's outside of our control. <laughs> that, yeah, it's <laughs> outside of our control, okay. but I think you can expect going forward that these state designations will be the tool that the legislature and the state uses mm -hmm. in order to tie those kinds of exemptions and benefits to. So, um, select, uh, well, okay, we're, I have two other things, but related to that, the um, it makes me wonder when we when Jericho as a town should apply to the state to reclassify the village center district. And what that process is, which you may not have the answer to. That, um, but, um, it's not until you have the zoning, any zoning changes pinned down, because your your application to the state, uh, your application materials are all going to be reflective of what does the zoning allow to have happen here. So the zoning needs to be done before you make any application. Okay. Um, and that, although we, we could have presumably have applied a few, you know, within the last number of years. You like, could, but if you want to, ex if you want, by example, if you wanted to expand the village center designation, it requires that the area be mixed use. And so if you are proposing to expand that boundary to an area that isn't already mixed use or isn't proposed to be mixed use, you'll run into a big question from the state. 
So it's important that make sure that you get your zoning organized the way you want it to be. What areas are mixed use? What are the, is then the supportive residential area around that, which might make for a good uh, neighborhood development area designation? And then you go to the state with, this is what our new zoning calls for, and we want our boundaries okay. adjusted accordingly. And then looking at the at your at this page here um it seems to me and then also by your jet uh logic for choosing the um cbz combining three and four it's i would think that it would be sort of obvious that the middle school the library and the dance studio would be part of the cbz i tend to think so but and i wonder if there would be an advantage going forward to the middle school or the library to be in the CBZ. Mm -hmm. Seems like there might be. Yeah. Um, Particularly because the way the character based zoning treats civic uses, they're actually much more permissive or they're intended to be much more permissive because their their form is very, very different of everything around it. And right. um, so I guess I would just think to include those in the. I think, I think, to your point, the dance studio would probably like very much to be included in that. It is not, right? It no, is it's not. It's not. not. It's okay. not. So that's not the little booth. But we were happy that it wasn't when we did it. Oh, okay. Well, going so forward, basically, right? that whole red oh, section would then turn purple. Everything. What, what Chris yes. is talking about, that <laughs> lower. Yeah. yeah. Everything yeah. on the Except east. Except the ball field at the bottom. No, right. the, every, so everything that's in to, red. It's up to the dotted line, right? All of this. Becomes purple. I would just make it purple. Yeah. Okay. And then what's the the boundary? The lower boundary is the river. Is the river. Mm -hmm. The southern yeah. boundary is the river. So, so make it purple, but understand that it'll be in the in the new character based zoning, it'll be a civic zone, so it'll actually be a different color. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the town owns that. So the town would have final say of what happens anyway. The town, oh, well, the school, the school, the, the school ground, district the school owns on. the owns the land. I think the town the owns the land. I don't think so. I don't know. I think the school district owns the land. I would think so. I think the and the district, park district owns its land. The district is CCSU or MMU combined, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that the district does not. Chuck, you were on the school board. Can you answer that question? Does the, does the town own the school or does the district own the school? Which one? Browns um, River. Browns River. Well, the district owns the school and owns the stuff. And the land. And, yeah. and, okay. the, and the former ID school. That that would be my expectation is that the school district owns all of that. What's the little, the other little red triangle down the southern piece? Yeah, that. This? That piece. in Mills Riverside Park. Oh, okay. That's, park, 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 that's where the park. farmer's market is. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Wendy, do you have comments or questions? Oh, no, I got. I, I was. I was a little confused with the boundaries, but I get it now. Okay. I, I like the idea of it simplifies it, and it's it's logical. It makes sense to me to eliminate two D three. Eric, set my piece. Comments, questions, Sarah. Simpler is better. Yeah. <laughs> Sabina. Ditto. No. Okay. Um, same for me. Simpler okay. is better. I think we have to be, you know, the criteria that you used creates a uniform map, but then the reality of parcels that straddle districts, mm -hmm. you have to, you're going to have to work through that issue a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that, you know, you might wind up with some micro adjustments based on that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when you think about setbacks, I think about um the most compact form in the purple in the village center mm -hmm. district budding up to then you know a slightly more residential less 
and if the setbacks that apply when you have that border should take that into account so that you don't necessarily have the most abrupt transition. And mm -hmm. I don't know, like in the form of, so yes, CD3 was a moat and and on, but on the other hand, there is like the concept with PUDs of like a buffer. And if there's any reason to think about the setbacks when you're just going from one district to the next. So you don't have to answer. No, now. What, Linda and actually Linda and I actually talked about that a little bit this afternoon. And I think the expectation here is that there's not a big transition from one to the other. It's much more seamless. And the distinction when you get into the residential area is that the ordinance allows the lots to get bigger. It allows the frontages to get bigger, whereas in the in the purple and blue area, it's more constrained. It doesn't allow them to get bigger. So in the red, you could still have very compact lots just like you could someplace else. The difference would be whether or not you've got a non-residential use on that really yeah. small lot. I think it's less, in my mind, less about the compactness. It's more about the the disparity of uses and that, you know, just making sure that everybody can. Yeah. And, and one, exist. one way you can approach that uh, is where two zoning districts abut one another is that you provide for a larger setback. Yes, that's exactly what I'm having in mind. Yeah, right. just along that boundary, yeah. which in for the most part, it's a rear property line. And if the rear property line, you know, minimum is three, well, where it abuts an adjacent zoning district, but maybe that minimum needs to be 50. Right. Okay. I have a quick question, which is sort of an aside, and we really spent a lot of time on it. But when you're thinking about these sort of changes, are you thinking with a 20 year range or a 100 year range? Like, what, how do you think about this kind of revision as you, like in terms of what sort of historical context? I, I think it's it's more like the 20 year timeline that you'll see this area get built out. If you want to think of it in terms of a hundred years, then <laughs> I think in the near ter term, you're really overzoning um, a lot of area because we would make this compact mixed use center probably substantially larger. Right. But I don't I don't think for a lot of reasons I don't think you're ready to go there. It's more important to get get these districts working properly and build the confidence and understanding of what they do that they do what you intended them to do and then as a next iteration you can be thinking about where where do we go from here and and uh, I may include just kind of as a side note at the end of the project, you know, if you were thinking along those lines, there's, these are some places that I might mm -hmm. go and why. I have, I have a clarifying question. Is is consideration of expansion of the village center boundaries, is that in scope of this grant or is that a separate conversation? The state designation? Yeah, the state designation. Yeah, it, it's not part of this grant. Okay. Uh, kind of the, the deliverables under this grant, grant, but I I dare say that anybody who's working on these kind of grants uh, that already has a state designation or is maybe working towards that, it's a pretty logical outcome. But so logically, though, then our next step would potentially be that everything purple becomes the designated village center state designation boundary, which is pretty close the yeah. way you drew it. And the red, we apply for a new designation, which we don't currently have, which is the neighborhood development area. In in concept, understanding yeah. that those designations are probably in a are, are going to change in who knows how many different ways, but yes, mm -hmm. something similar. If the village center designation uh, allows for a larger area that isn't just dominantly mixed use, then you could theoretically take this whole area and ask for it to be so designated, but the, the program doesn't function that way yet. So the, the village center designation that this program that the state offers 
is rooted in historical preservation, which has been limiting in terms of where the boundary can be historically. Mm -hmm. Last year, the legislature um, requested a study to modernize that state designation program, and I have not seen the outputs of, I saw the recommendations, yeah. but I don't know if anything has formally changed yet mm -hmm. um, because it was recognized that those historic boundaries may not make sense anymore um, with what's there and what's desirable. Yeah. I've not seen anything and I'd be really surprised if the department has focused any attention on that yet because the getting the new legislation through was a priority and it will help set the stage for ultimately what they what they do. So we're <laughs> we are on like a regular schedule for recertifying the village center designation, right? Do I have to do it every yeah. five or ten years something, or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody know when the next when the anniversary is that this is coming up anyway? Uh, I do. Okay. <laughs> it was last year. No. Oh. So it was just done. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not like we have that, but that we can go. That's not a hold up for going back. Like if we right. adopt something like this this year, then our next step we can do that next year. Yeah, I mean, I think the program is going to evolve in the very near future. So, what I've heard in the recommendations is there may not even be a need to reapply mm -hmm. because you make once you have it, you have it. Like people generally don't want to just stop mm -hmm. having it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the question is more around adjustments or changes to the delineation. Mm -hmm. Well, I would think if the state is encouraging development in village centers, they would be open to the idea that the village centers might need to expand. Right. Yeah. And make it easier to have them. Right. Mm -hmm. less. Yeah. And part of that conversation also is focused on some communities that have village centers in floodplains. Mm -hmm. And they are continuously getting flooded, but the state's saying, this is where we want you to concentrate your mm -hmm. development and your housing. And it's like, maybe that's not such a good idea to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the conversation too. So it seems like we're positively disposed to Chris's and then David's idea. Um, are, what are the downsides of doing this? What, what are we not thinking about? What are the un unintended consequences? What's complicated about it? Why would they have done it that way in the first place when this seems so much more sensible? It doesn't make any sense to me at all why they did it the way they did it the first time, except for the fact <clears throat> that the area around the former Green Crow Lumber was the focal point of what's going to happen here, what's going to happen here. So they they focused almost entirely on that parcel and a couple of parcels nearby. Mm -hmm. They didn't really stop and take a broader view and think about how does it fit along with everything else? Because it, it makes no sense at all to me why you wouldn't be allowing for mixed use along Route 15. Um, it's not a place where, you know, it, it's a busy road. And a busy road is a place where non-residential uses want to be, uh, for visibility's sake, and quiet residential, you know, single unit households probably don't don't want to be. You know, you might have multifamily housing there um, because you've got some some older historic buildings that can be uh, subdivided easily to provide for that. But you know, you're not going to see a lot of new small residential development there. Um, but you would see mixed use. I think it was a part of a really suburban mindset um, that they created CD3. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's my take. I think there was a very suburban mindset underlying most of this. And yes. I think that's what caused that for me, in my opinion. Okay. okay. So are we ahead of schedule? Uh, have, you, have you do you have more questions for us or more work that you want us to do? This this is really the the big one in terms of as I said, with these this scope of changes that we've been talking about in the last two meetings helps me set the stage for. All right, now we can now I can come to you with this is what I recommend the development standards be in these two districts and why you can see the relationship 
these are what I would recommend the uses be. What do you think, particularly around those non-residential uses in the <clears throat> in the residential area? Um, and we can go on to have other conversations about Jericho Center and Jericho Corners, which I think are a little simpler because you don't have this dynamic of these two ordinances that are not really playing well together. So we are, you are then thinking that the current conventional village center will, won't apply to the Correct. Riverside. Correct. Riverside so, neighborhood, whatever I, whatever but I you said. you can imagine that that district is governed by the conventional zoning. Yes. So you're creating new columns to the table. Just a new column in the table. Text in some of the standards. Yep. So in a way, it's a swap. Mm -hmm. So it's simpler because we have less of a CZZ district, but we're not really down a district because we're completely. Yeah, but I think the getting render, rid of districts, you know, isn't necessarily the objective. It's making sure that the districts do what you want them to do. So if even if you add more districts, if if each one does what it what you really needed to do. <laughs> that's okay. Um, again, because the applicant reads typically reads a zoning ordinance based on where they live. Right? You don't read zoning like a book. You read it based on, I live here, the zoning district is this, therefore, what can I do? So they don't care how many districts are. They only care about the district that they're in. Okay. I have a residual question about, sorry, Chris. That's okay, go ahead. That's I, I wasn't quite understanding what you were referring to about uh, Jerry Hill's Senior Center. Mm -hmm. So it it would be part of, can you just go back to that part again? Because I, I was hoping that wasn't going to be an un, unintended consequence of the change. Like, it, would that adversely impact that parcel? No, largely the zoning for that property remains the same. Yes, there's the opportunity to perhaps have more units there or to have, you know, have the lot be smaller, but it, it, it's outside of the character based zoning. Now it continues to be, um, it's still within the state designation. Um, why? I'm not sure other than it's, uh, you know, senior housing, multi-unit development. So maybe there's some advantage. But the village center. No. The neighborhood district zoning will welcome that kind of totally. development yeah. all over. Yes. Every place that's red could have many more Jerry Hill senior yeah. housing, just like that. Yeah, potentially. Would that conflict with the state designation then? Because we're removing something that is currently in the state designation and taking it out of it. Mm, no, the state. The, I mean, it's still it's still there. It's still allowed. Um, it's still under the state designation. You're not taking anything away. Yeah, the state designation is exactly the same. We're not making any changes. And the zoning, that. the underlying zoning for that, those properties really doesn't change in any any meaningful way. And it, or it, sh it shouldn't. When at the end of the day, if if we've done something that does, then those would be those would be the kinds of things we should be looking for. So I have a quick procedural question. So. Re revising the boundaries of CD3 and CD4, that process is part of this. Correct. Okay. Yep. Because it's inside the boundary. Okay. Of the yeah. area. There will be a new map or maps that are associated with okay. uh, all the text changes that will come with it. Okay. Good. So should we go to public comment? Sure. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes. Again. Although David will probably rely on you to help with the um with to help with public comments. Absolutely. So yeah. Bill, can you come forward? I'm going to use the timer. Sorry. I didn't talk a lot. Okay. No, you guys were great. You were right right on the money. Okay, Bill Butler. I wondered. I think the people along Route 15 with the uh, sidewalk event that's happening and uh, they're concerned about the dimensions of Riverside, you know, there's going to be a 10-story building or something. 
Um, I hope this doesn't put them in a in a ringer or is anything going to change for them? Whether taxes change is, you know, the people are wrong along Route 15. I'm wanting to be very sympathetic to a group of people that I think sometimes feels ignored. And so uh, can we assure them that there is not going to be a tax ramification for them as it sits today? That's okay. Good okay. point. Thank you. And I also wanted to put a plug in for parking. Um, we want to park our our cars under our building. We don't want to park it. Just so I hope we can accommodate that in our, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would encourage you to expand the village center sooner than later. I mean, what's happening now is that we have reserved the areas outside the village center basically for large lot luxury homes and large amounts of land are being consumed with this sprawl. And so even if it's a PUD, the one on Morgan Road is 27 acres of really good land in the area that you have contemplated being the extension of the village center. The same thing is happening down Plains Road. So the land that you might want to expand into and make housing possible for low and middle and middle income people is going to be gone. The long you, you wait, you can't wait. You know, to, I mean, stuff is happening. And I know you're captive to a twenty five thousand dollar grant in terms of considering things outside the village center. But I think you can hold two things at once. And I would I'd be pushing for. Um, you know, expand the village center sooner than later. I also think on some of these things, I mean, for example, you know, requiring people to live next to the road, you should survey people who live in the village centers now and see how many of them wish they lived closer, you know, to the road. And I would also caution this, I, the, the historical precedent is sort of used quite selectively, okay? It's like, we built a bunch of houses in the 19th century before there was cars, trucks, motorcycles, Jake brakes, and military vehicles. Everybody lived next to the road in all districts, um, but you know, don't apply it just to one district. And then we're saying, oh, we have to be really careful of whether there's commercial activity next to residential activity. Well, historically there was. So it's like this selective, basically we're, you know, there's the town has a habit of picking out historical precedents, the ones that help the town get to what they want as opposed to, you know, really, I think taking a a, a, a consistent view on um, you know on historical precedent. I mean, look at look at the, look at a map from the eighteen seventies and see where the houses are. Uh, somehow, we exempt people from Nashville Road and Skunk Hollow from living next to the road for certainly not. It, it, it's certainly not a historical thing for, for these long lots with you know um you know enormous front yards thank you sarah jane buddy um i have a couple of um kind of maybe clarifying questions one is i think that we we currently only have one state designated village center, which is Riverside, I think. I don't think that the corners or the center are. Um, no, that's and, not correct. They no? Are all, they are, all, each village has a designated center, yes. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, cool, okay, I thought we were gonna, I, I, I thought we had talked about trying to do that and that it, they didn't meet. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, good to know. Uh, and then I, I guess I got confused at one point, David, I thought I heard you say that um, in the near future, we might want to broaden the uh, the designated village center area um, and that we would want the zoning to be in place before we did that. So by using the current designated borders, aren't we limiting ourselves um, by not expanding beyond those current borders. Um, and then my next question is, 
um, not understanding, um, and, and maybe we'll, we'll find this out more at future meetings, not understanding really what that Riverside Village neighborhood looks like in relation to our other village centers. And so when, when you, I think it was called the rural trajectory uh, slide that you've used a couple of times and you showed um, the village center and uh, CBD four um, as being kind of village centers and then CBD three as being, I don't know what it was, neighborhood. Are you then suggesting taking the village center, the red, and moving it further down that trajectory to where CD3 was. So less density, less diversity, less whatever than it, it currently is as a village center, or um, is, it, is it just a small step in between this, this really dense, compact, mixed use of um, what is currently CD4? Um, but it'll still be a village center where we want to still see that kind of density and diverse housing type and et cetera, et cetera. Susan, do you want me to respond? Yes. <laughs> so SJ, uh, to your second question, um, it is still a village center. It is still intended to be mixed use and compact. So it's not a, a great departure down the transect to something that is more suburban, more um, single use. Um, the intent here is that it's already zoned uh, for a certain level of development and activity, and we're not going to go backwards. Um, we're in fact, we're going to allow for more intensity here, the more diversity of uses where people want to take advantage of that possibility, but but we're not going to uh, lessen, the, we're not going to um, put greater limits on what can happen there. Um, and to your point about the, the current state designation boundaries, yes, we're limiting ourselves, but um, I was testing the waters with the commission here to see, as I propose this, does this make sense? Uh, are there places where we should be expanding the, the CD4, the, the mixed use core, um, and that may lie outside of that. I don't think that there are, but I didn't want to presume that um, that there might not be a different opinion. So I I use that as a as a starting point in my rubric. Okay, thanks, S.J. Wayne Wayne Ellis. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really like the presentation by David, and I congratulate you. Um, I came a little late, and I saw a question about parking, and I was wondering uh, what what the what the vision was for sufficient parking for the people that would live in this village that might need to be able to. I heard Bill say that he was going to have parking underneath his uh, his building, but what about for the other you know dense neighborhoods and all? Where was the vision for the parking for those folks. This was this is to David. Yeah. Is that your only question, Wayne? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. So ultimately the decision around uh how much parking gets created is one that is coming upon a, a project by project basis. And um it really depends on the variety of the, the uses or variety of uses that are being proposed on a given site, um, but, uh, and how those uses relate to one another. Um, certainly the zoning recommendations uh, allow for people to create parking on site. They allow for uh, parking to uh, be created within, uh, you know, new streets or the like, um, as, as Bill suggested, Parking can be underground, parking can be, you know, in a surface lot, can be in a structure someplace. Um, it can go a wide variety of different places. What we're talking, one of the particular changes that we've talked about in the character-based zoning is that the parking requirements, the amount of parking that is required of a, of a new development is much higher than it needs to be, which is, which creates, um, a, a lot of requires a, 
a project to consume a lot more land, become a lot more expensive than may be necessary. So we're looking at reducing that parking requirement, but there's nothing that would prevent somebody from building more parking than the minimum required. This Would this be a recommendation then? I'm just thinking if you have a one bedroom unit, more than likely there'll be two people living in there. Right? 21st century. <laughs> Correct. So if you if you have a single dwelling unit, um, there is a, a requirement. The requirement would be for a single parking space for a single dwelling unit. If you wanted to have two, if you wanted to have three, you could do that. But you have to have one. Okay. Um, I think I think there are provisions for relief from that, but. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is that um, I was dialed into a Richmond meeting and um, they're starting to run against the wall of how much on street parking they can have. And uh, wondering if there's going to be enough parking if they build more units because they have they have a wastewater treatment plant. So they have far more flexibility than we have on, on that side. OK, I was just wondering what your view was on that. Thank you. Bold. Good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Anybody going to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go, oh. No, we all are. <laughs> <laughs> Done it exactly well. Right. Wait, right. wait, wait till you see the actual language. <laughs> well, the red lines are always scary, but yes. I think. Um, Did a great job. More uses by right, more housing types, more compact, more walkable, right? Allow, allow and, for them to be created. And more right. simplicity, as Sarah said, right. simpler, simpler is better. Right. Allow buildings to be closer together. You're not requiring them to be closer together, but you're allowing them to be close relative to the pattern that exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think, I think the the mood of the planning commission is is more flexibility so that there's more creativity, there's more options. We can't we we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's right for everybody right. on their individual parcels. And really knowing like where the drop dead issues are and everything else really can be a lot more fluid than our predecessors seem to think. Mm -hmm. I don't want so many steps. I know I'm breaking in here. Yeah, you're I... breaking in. No, you can't break in. You can't <laughs> I... allow it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so we're moving on to the next topic. Yes, okay. So good, so we have a little more time to talk about wastewater. Um, so our next item on the agenda is to debrief from the two wastewater meetings that happened since our last meeting, uh, Jericho Corners and Riverside. So I went to one, but not the other. I think Sarah went, Sarah went to the corners. I went to Riverside and I know Linda, you were at both. You were at both. That's right. You were at all three. Oh, you get this gold star. <laughs> um, so what observations, learnings did people think were important for the rest of us who weren't at all meetings to know and to hear? Wanna go first? Sure. Um the Jericho Corners meeting was not as well attended as the other two, surprisingly, because I think it is the one that has the most residents, but it was on the same night as the BRMS band concert so I don't know if that had an impact but I had to leave early anyway um I think there was only five or six folks in person here and another five or six online for that one um there were some thoughtful questions that were asked John Ashley uh as in all the presentations did an excellent job of explaining the study um I don't remember anything in particular that stood out as any surprising comments or anything to note, um, yeah, so that one was pretty smooth. And then the Riverside one was very well attended. I think there were 
about 30 people in the room and another 25 to 30 online um, at various points. Um, seems like there is a lot of interest. Um, yeah, and it was, uh, yeah, a good conversation. There was, you know, again, thoughtful questions being asked, which is always uh, encouraging. Um, didn't seem like there was anyone there with a particular agenda either either way for or against. I think it seemed like people understood this is, you know, just informational meetings and we're showing up to learn about, you know, what what had been going on with the study. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to that, Sabina? No, I think those are my observations as well. That people were receptive to listening to the engineer and that he did a really good job of um, not, you know, listening to the questions and the comments. And then what I noticed is over time, he was actually incorporating people's comments into his next presentation. So he was building on what people were saying. So I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sarah, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah. Um... I had two reactions. I think the first one was that this is going to sound really ignorant, but I want to be honest. I did not understand that the Pinecrest neighborhood, which backs up to the other side of um, Snowflake Drive off of Griswold, was not included in the Jericho Corners village district and and based on the the presentation just looking at the map and possible locations for a system in the corners i was i just was really struck by the irony that you might be able to see it from pinecrest but not be included in it if it were installed in the jericho corners area um and I was a little bit surprised by the price for sure. Mm -hmm. But again, I think I, I was expecting to be surprised by the price and of sticker shock. So I just think it would be a hard sell to all the people in, in an established home, especially the ones who had already paid, you know, 20 or $30,000 to replace their existing wastewater system to try and get them to sign up for something um those those people who will need to replace their system within the next five or 10 or 15 years i think would be fans but for for everyone else in town seeing that bill i think would be tough whereas the potential to do it somewhere like riverside to me again only speaking for myself seems seems like a lot more like a better use of of resources for future opportunity more palatable because you have a more potential new development compared to people who have already made their own investments. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, I would add that, and I think maybe this would be, I'd be interested to see how the engineer maybe addresses this going forward is that they're so in Riverside, they were one of the disposal sites identified is at the middle school, obviously. And there was murmuring of people in front of me. And then also people did ask the question out loud, very concerned about disposal sites so close to the river. And I and he kind of addressed that a little bit about water quality and water quality testing. Um, but it seems like if there could be a robust conversation, either at the 90% report or whatever, knowing that that concern is out there about here's what the technology is and here's why we know that this is a reasonable solution and don't worry about it like we hear, but here's how that gets addressed. I think that would probably go a long way toward making a Riverside solution more acceptable. Um, what he he did also say, I thought I heard him say that 
somebody asked him, when is the 90% report going to be done? And he said, um, not in, not within less than two months. That was how he answered that right. question. Not? Not in less than two months. So not sooner, okay. not sooner than two months. So at least two months. Um, so in my mind, I was thinking like, does that mean that the 90% report is potentially going to be available in the like, early fall, August, September kind of time frame? Um, and I was also thinking about the town plan where um, the planning commission did identify the wastewater study as something that we thought we should um, potentially express an opinion about to the select board when the time was appropriate for that. Um, I think if you remember, we that was when we had the conversation about like who should lead and who's responsible and we're not responsible but I think the sentiment was that the planning commission has a certain point of view and that we could be helpful to the select board as they're receiving, not necessarily the 60% report, but the 90% report. We could be helpful to the select board by helping them see if and how any of these alternatives fit into meeting the goals of the town plan. They're all coming back to you now. You're remembering this. Is this PTSD. a way of addressing Chuck's comment at the start? Uh, no, sort not of. directly. I mean, I already had this on my agenda right, anyway, but, it's, but it's same issue. thing. Yes. Okay. So we okay. we did, it, we are tasked with that in the town plan. So I wanted to raise it here tonight because now the 60% reports are done. The 90% report will theoretically be coming to the town within the next few months. So I'm thinking on the planning commission's agenda, once that 90% report is available, would be a pretty good review and discussion about that report and a decision about what we want our contribution around it to be. What do you anticipate the difference is between the 60% and the 90%? Um, I think the 90% goes into a lot more detail about cost and funding. Yeah. Are think, accurate. You said life cycle costs yeah. are considered mm -hmm. and non-monetary factors as well, pros and cons. Um, I think they also will make recommendations because this presentation, there was there was like these are the uh, yeah, these are the much. alternatives. Yeah, it's neutral. I think it will also become focused on one or more of the options as the preferred alternatives. Mm -hmm. I guess it would seem to me then that if we wanted the town to be more proactive about a priority for the study. The town should do that before the 90% work is done. This would be the time to do it because this would be the chance to say, we got it. It's a good, you know, we, we like what we see, but this is our priority. Focus on that as you move towards 90%. I think if we wait till 90%, you know, it's not going to happen in the last 10%. <laughs> so I think that's too late if we want to do that. Chris, when you say this is our priority, writ large it is, but in specific, are you saying our priority is Riverside, Corners, Center, our priority is this facility, this location? What what priority are we talking about? I think we're talking about prioritizing Riverside as the most, uh, as the best place to get the most out of a new system that would benefit the most people. And that in my there's in my mind there's no question. I mean, I would think it's even close, but you know. so and that's sort of been the priority of the town plan. The, 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 the most the, the potential for growth, not not the existing population, right? Yes, yeah. but if we're addressing the potential for to add new housing, that's right. Yeah, that would be the best place to do it. Okay, actually, 
I'm going to say we, we, this is a good discussion that the planning commission should have as an agenda item. And I, I was thinking of having it later and you're suggesting having it sooner, which makes sense to me. So well, you brought it up. So I yes. Okay. So maybe I could work with Linda a little bit more right. about the next several meetings and seeing what kind of a structure, what we want our outcome output to look like and to contain and what the timing of that should be and how that would fit in and then come back and to have it as an agenda item at some point in the near future where we could have a good discussion about it, which is like, okay, let's look at the report. What do we know? What's outstanding? And I think um, at that point, we could have a, a also a better understanding of what growth projections he used. Maybe even we could potentially ask him to visit with us. I, I don't know if we would need that, but whatever. Um, what growth projections he did use and what growth projections we might suggest he uses in, in addition or in step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that was pretty conservative on his yeah. growth You know, he was, but he, he was from a population point of view, but I asked that question in the meeting because yeah. his flow increase was a 40% increase and his population increase was just based on like a minuscule population number. And he explained that the difference in the flow was accommodating development that he was became aware of through these conversations, which was primarily Riverside. So the population number isn't, isn't the number that he's mm -hmm. using. You know, that also just assumes that the population is going to be full of a lot more. Of yes, I, right. <laughs> yep. Okay, so. I have to have a little bit of humor in here. <laughs> I thought of the same thing. <laughs> You're right. Well, I guess um, uh, the other approach would be to say, this is the land we have. Um, this much acreage would support this big a system. Let's do that. Yes, but what he explained is that you can't get projects funded that way. So that's... What do you mean? Can we talk about it when we actually talk about it? Uh, I, I, I think okay. That's a good idea. Chris, did you attend any of the meetings? I didn't. Um, there are recordings. I saw, the, I did see the one on the center. I okay, that one, I messed up and there was a technical glitch, so didn't get the whole thing <laughs> recorded, but um, the other two were fully recorded. Okay. It might help you okay. to get up to speed to watch one that has the full recording. Sure. Um, because I think some of those questions would be answered there. Um, and I'll and, talk and to Paula about, online, about so, so. yeah, the slides are on the town website. I'm not sure if the recordings have been posted or not. There are, are they all like, well, are they all posted? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And if you watch them at 1.5, you get everything in the last time. <laughs> um okay, so that was about the wastewater. Anything else about the wastewater? Let's get it done. Yeah, really. Let's get it done. Can I ask okay. a tangential question? Yeah, I'm sure. just curious about the internship, the intern from the, the grant. Did that come to, that related to wastewater? For the, the it is. For no, it's UVM. Yeah. Um, we have a meeting to discuss it next week. Cool. But yeah, it's uh, as far as I understand, it's happening and the logistics just need to be figured out. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on then to number eight, reporting events. So do planning commission members have any liaison updates or events that they've gone to or are going to? No? I'm going to the Urban and Community Forestry annual meeting on Thursday. And Sabina, also, you passed on, there's like a big walk bike summit. You passed that on to Cody of the bike head committee. Mm -hmm. And we don't know yet if anybody's going to go, but possibly. Right. I signed up for that. Also, there is um, there is the um, Vermont 
council on something about development. They're having a a summit on how to how a town can generate economic growth, which I would like to go to. Um, I just sent an email to Paula to find out if we, the town, are members in this particular organization because you get a cheaper ticket that way. But I haven't heard back from her yet. But um, yeah, it's coming up sometime in the near future, but I don't it seemed interesting, yeah, and potentially useful. Okay. And then Sabina and I presented to the bike ped committee the town plan because they have a new chair, they have new members. We should we explained at a high level the town plan. We focused on connectivity. We showed them the getting it done chart and pointed out the things that related directly to their to them, suggested that they think about organizing their work plan to meet the goals of the town plan. I think it was well received. They seem pretty fired up and ready to go. So um, they we did also talk with them about the project of an official map. And we said this is coming down the pike, but it would be good for you guys to start thinking about looking at the 2015 bike ped plan what's been done, what remains to be done, what's outstanding, what's outdated, what needs to be added on, because we're gonna be coming to you in the next several months, not now, but like in the fall or early winter to start working with you on an official map. And it would be good if you had your ideas in the queue. So that was pretty good meeting. Um, okay, other business. I have one. SJ arranged for town committees to be at the farmer's market again this summer and is asking if we want to sign up for any times to be there. And um, thank you, David. Hi, David. Is anybody interested to spearhead that? I won't be here physically some, so I'm not able to do it. And I know we've done it the last few years, We'll probably have our zoning ideas that we could potentially talk about or socialize out there. I think sometimes we've had good conversations. It's good to have be visible, but it's not always the most productive. What do you guys think? I was going to say the times I've done it have been not very productive. I mean, fun to hang out, but not. You got good tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. It, it, it's in the geographic area where we're talking about making changes, so it feels like it's important to be there, even if it's maybe not necessarily, you know, high traffic. But it, I think it would. It feels like just due diligence to be visible about what's what are the our proposed changes for this area. I, I would agree. I agree one hundred percent. I would add to it that this is a really good time to talk about wastewater. Hmm. While we're there, in yeah. one of the spots that is yeah. likely to be near where the wastewater will be um, released or the outlook will go. Disposed of. Yeah. So once during the summer, twice during the summer. And then I maybe, Wendy, I could follow up with you about it yeah. offline. Yeah, I would think what? twice if they're offering it, but yeah. later when we have more. Okay. And information, I would say, like maybe July, like it goes through September. Yeah. Right? Or maybe August and September. Yeah. Does that feel reasonable? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I'm just looking at our anticipated schedule uh, for this zoning update. And I have the Planning Commission hearing penciled in on September 17th. Mm -hmm. So we'd want to do it before that mm -hmm. by a few weeks. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll follow up with SJ about it and thanks to SJ for organizing it. And I'll go for some, for maybe like early August, early September kind mm -hmm. of thing. Okay, any other new business or other business? Uh, we could talk about walkthroughs. So Sabina and I did do a walkthrough through the Riverside property last weekend. Yes. So we were going to have that on our next meeting agenda. Okay. We'll, we'll hold on. Because they were 
not yeah. all done, but some were done, I think. Look forward to hearing about it. Okay. All right. So that's perfect. So that goes to wrap up and playing for next meeting. Wow, this is the first meeting we've been early in a while. Um, so our next meetings are June 4th and June 18th. June 4th, Linda suggested that we include the feedback from everybody's village walkthroughs, right? And then David left. But so what do you have for June 4th and June 18th in the queue? For both of those meetings, we have David with us and we'll be discussing with the village center zoning. It might be nice to have David here when we're giving our walkthrough presentations or discussions about it, just so we can hear what, what we saw as individuals. Mm -hmm. Yes, he will be here for that. Okay. Yeah. And that's the whole meeting, mm -hmm. like this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anybody need anything else to be covered in those meetings? No, but I, I well, I don't know. <clears throat> um, I guess I want to ask about, again, our involvement or not in the town budget and in the capital plan. And it, uh, just it, when we want to consider those. Um, so I have had a couple of follow up conversations on that with Peter because I, I wanted to um, bring him up to speed on what the that there's a task in the town plan what that means and what our expectation would be of our participation um i need to circle back with him because we had a pretty extensive conversation sabina had a bunch of notes from the training that we had here in town hall which i shared with peter um i also um we just had a, a, a good productive conversation. So I'm not exactly sure at the moment what his next step is going to be about it. So let me circle back with him and then maybe I could report back to the group on that on either June 4th. I'm probably at June 4th. Okay. okay. Peter and I, we would talk mostly about the capital budget, like mm -hmm. how you migrate from tracking trucks and truck depreciation to actually having like a comprehensive mm -hmm. capital improvement program. Okay. And I gave him a bunch of resources to start with because he he's new to mm -hmm. it also, but he seemed motivated to kind of change the approach to budgeting. Um, okay, anything else? Motion to adjourn. Did I ask a question? No. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Chris, thank you. Sorry. Eric, thank you. All those in favor of adjourn? Aye. Aye. Happy to chat with you all.